welcome all of you viewers from wherever you are and you're joining us here coming live from golf course hotel and our discussion this afternoon demonstrates that despite the COVID pandemic and the lockdown some work goes on this afternoon we're here to discuss building resilience and recovery of micro small and medium enterprises from the second COVID-19 lockdown MSMEs constitute the biggest part of our economy and they are hit most. They cannot um, survive very many days in such a lockdown. And we have to discuss how resilience, which has become a key word this, uh, uh, this, this time round, how it can be done for SMEs. And we shall also look at some research-based assertions uh, carried out by the Economic Policy Research Center, who is our organizer this afternoon, plus the IDRC, uh, which is from Canada. Uh, they support and put forward assertions, directions based on research. And we have one such research which has been carried out very recently on the impact of uh, the lockdown on MSMEs. And of course, later we shall have uh, a panel discussion of people who know what they're talking about in these areas to give us insights on how uh, SMEs, MSMEs can um, be resilient in this scenario, we are not sure whether there will not be another wave and then, so resilience is very, very critical. So looking forward. So crisis is inevitable and COVID-19 has tested uh, many systems, countries, people and businesses. So resilience is very important. So the question is, how are Ugandan MSMEs faring in the wake of this pandemic? And that's what we are going to try to find out uh, this afternoon. Right now, I would like to kick us off uh, by uh, listening to our uh, opening remarks from the Executive Director for the Economic Policy Research Center, Dr. Sarah Sawanyana. Doctor, you're welcome to give us your opening remarks as we set the ball rolling on this very important discussion this afternoon. You're welcome. Good afternoon and good morning, all those who have joined us via uh, Zoom, as well as those who are joining us via NTV. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this virtual meeting on building resilience. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this virtual conference on building resilience and recovery of the mid micro, small to medium enterprises from the second COVID-19 lockdown. This virtual meeting is organized by the Economic Policy Research Center with financial support from the min from government of Uganda and the International Development Research Center based in Canada. As EPRC, we are so grateful for this kind of support. Uh, the National Development, the National Development, National Development Plan, so really recognizes the central role of MSEs in Uganda's development path. It calls for strengthening these enterprises. It also calls for strengthening the private sector to drive growth, which includes promotion of effective and efficient private investment and development of, the, of these enterprises. Thus, this virtual conference is timely and aligns well with Uganda's development path in the next five years. However, the COVID pandemic and the containment measures adopted by government of Uganda have to a great extent disrupted this development path and in particular, the critical role of the SMEs in Uganda's development. development. You will all agree with me that yes, there have been some positives, but there have also been some negatives. So we need to address that. So the most challenging part of, the mitigate, of mitigating the impact of the pandemic 
is basically is, is uh, striking a balance between and across saving lives as well as preserving livelihoods. What do I mean here? In terms of saving lives, we need to strike a balance between saving lives between, uh, from COVID-19 and non-COVID related diseases. This has remained a challenge throughout the two lockdowns Uganda has undergone, and especially the second lockdown. That's striking of the balance because as you will hear from some of the findings, this is an area where people thought that uh, we haven't done very well. Uh, in terms of livelihood, it's really again a striking balance between which, which businesses should you allow to operate during the lockdown, given the interlinkages that we know that do exist between these businesses. Again, that is really uh, something which government has been grappling with. Uh, the second lockdown came at a time when the MS, MSEs were still adopting to the new normal after the second lockdown in 2020. But it's also a fact we know that these MSEs were already struggling before the COVID-19, before COVID-19. They are struggling in terms of finances. They are struggling in terms of working capital, struggling in terms of capacity utilization, and also struggling in terms of operating informally. Because as SMEs, if you are trying to operate informally, there is no way you can expect the government to reach you. Okay? Uh, consequently, the disruptions due to the lockdowns have had an even impact on, the, on these enterprises. And you will be able to hear some of these impacts. So the pride of these enterprises of deep concern, given their central role in Uganda's development path, then this raises some questions that we need to, uh, we need to uh, think about. What needs to be done differently? Not only to support the SMEs to revive business, but also to build their resilience, resilience for any future shocks. Let it be the third uh, lockdown or something like that, but how best can we build their resilience? So the main objective of this virtual conference is basically to share our findings from a rapid assessment that was done during, uh, during, the COVID, during the second lockdown. But this was done in Greater Kampala given the mobility restrictions. And the uh, survey was done through face-to-face -face interviews as well as uh, through key informant interviews. And we are very, very grateful to all those who spared their time to participate in this survey. I uh, thank you so much for that. And I also thank the EPRC team, which they had to go do the face-to-face -face interviews during these difficult times. So what do we need to, what do we expect from this uh, uh, conference? We expect to hear from you, to get your thoughts, on our findings, especially in terms of what needs to be different. So we also need to know that some businesses have been able to be, some businesses have been resilient. Now how do we pick lessons from those who have been resilient to help those businesses which are struggling? Number three, we also need to hear from you because most of the panelists are representing associations. And we've read about some of these associations. And you find some of the, most of the associations are about networking and knowledge sharing. We don't see the associations being so active in terms of helping these businesses raising uh, working capital or something like that. So what is it that we can be able to do differently to ensure that these associations are effective and can be able to, can be able to support the different businesses? Uh, because of time, I can end it here. We can be able to discuss further 
after listening to the panelists. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Swanyana. Uh, normally, there will be uh, applause here, but uh, things are virtual. And I know people on Zoom, even if they clap, we, we, won't hear, <laughs> we won't hear them. But we know that they appreciate your opening remarks. Thank you very much. Now to set us um, uh, on the path of discussion. And viewers, we said that this uh, discussion today is um, underlined by research most recent research done in Greater Kampala. We are going to watch the presentation of the research findings, but it has been put together in a pre-recorded video with illustrations for your own appreciation. Then after the video, we'll come back with our panelists to digest, add meaning, thresh all the things so that when we're done today, we take away value, perhaps even some policy interventions. So let's now watch the video of the findings, and we hope you stay with us. My name is Julius Kiza. I'm a professor of political economy of development and a research associate at the Economic Policy Research Center. Today's conversation is on a critical subject of building resilience and the recovery of micro, small to medium enterprises from the COVID-19 lockdown. And I'm interested in raising a few issues which I think, I think are central to this subject matter. The first is that resilience building is multidimensional. The literature is very clear. In resilience building, several things must be taken into consideration. The first is preparedness. What we mean by preparedness for disaster means that we need to be proactive rather than waiting for a crisis and then engage the gear of reactive preparedness. The second issue is the issue of leadership and management. Leadership is extremely important, whether we are talking about leadership at the national level, but in the case of our subject matter, we are talking about leadership at the farm level, the enterprise level. It makes a huge difference when you have a leadership that is in full charge, a leadership that is visionary, a leadership that is ready to engage with the pandemic and the challenges associated with the pandemic. The third issue is the issue of adaptability. An effective leadership will drive the adaptive ability of the enterprise to be able to sail through the stormy waters and remain afloat and vibrant. The fourth issue is the issue of staff competitiveness, the idea that staff capacities must be rebuilt, the reskilling of the labor force, the idea that we have to enter the new digital spaces and be able to leverage technologies and succeed in the turbulent times. The fourth issue is the idea of being creative. Being creative means we think outside the box. We try to think of new ways. And we think of new ways by rethinking the old practices the old behaviors, the old business processes and technologies have to be rethought. The idea is to ensure that we tabulate the stormy waters and remain afloat and competitive. These elements of resilience building are central to the conversation that brings us here today. I hasten to add that COVID-19 is not a simple public health crisis. COVID-19 is multidimensional. It is a complex problem that has serious social, political, psychosocial, psychological, cultural, even religious dimensions. To take a typical example, in Africa, the respondents to our study said nobody dies because of all the deaths. Nobody dies because their time has come. Whoever dies, somebody must have bewitched them. So when people in the community, especially in the rural areas, see somebody who has died, they won't say this is because of the microbial enemy called coronavirus. They will say somebody must have bewitched them. So the adaptive behavior of the people around them, whether we're talking of people in the community or in business, 
the behavior of the people around them might not change sufficiently to ensure that the pandemic is resolved. It is on the basis of some of these observations that Professor Hugh Hamukwanason has advised that the public policy response to COVID mainly focused on the scientific answers, the scientific intervention, that what we missed out are the non-science variables which are central to an impactful response to the COVID disaster. So we need to deploy a multi-pronged approach if we really want to be effective in managing the COVID pandemic. I am going now to invite my colleague, Dr. Francis Mwesije, to continue with a conversation on the complex interlinkages that have been profiled by the COVID-19 crisis. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Chiza, for that uh, interesting introduction. Uh, I'll be continuing with this conversation. My name is Dr. Francis Mwesuji. I'm a senior research fellow here at the Economic Policy Research Center. Uh, the other lesson we've learned from COVID is that it has exposed the interlinkages between sectors. We learned that the closure of any of MSME is disastrous to other uh, related MSMEs or businesses. For example, let's take an example of a school. When you close a school, it is interdependent on very many other actors around it. You close a school, you affect those that supply stationery. You affect financial institutions that uh, give these schools loans. You affect the transporters. You affect the food market. Uh, during the rapid assessment that uh, EPRC undertook, we actually found or many vendors reported that they had supplied schools and had not been paid. <coughs> so closure of the school meant that these traders could not uh, recoup uh, one their capital and many were running with less capital. So you can see that just the uh, closure of a school has many uh, multiplier or it has multiplier effects on other related sectors. You can actually take any other example, for example, Chikubo. When you close Chikubo, you affect the whole chain of actors that supply or depend on Chikubo for survival. You affect transporters, you affect clearing uh, agents, you affect uh, the importers and all that. So what does that mean? It actually tells us that each, any measure that targets any of the players should have this wider or bigger picture of the likely effects uh, at the macro level and not only to that uh, specific player. The other lesson we learned from COVID is that it has tested governance and delivery systems. Uh, look at and uh, take an example of trust in government institutions. In the most concluded uh, rapid survey, we actually learned that many uh, stakeholders or actors in uh, micro, small and medium enterprises were wondering whether some of the promises will ever be fulfilled and when they will ever be fulfilled if they had be fulfilled. Uh, after the, in the aftermath of the first lockdown, that was last year, the government rolled out a number of interventions, uh, including EMIOGA, including the support to private uh, schools, the 20 billions uh, for teachers circle. Uh, then we have the most recent one during the second lockdown of the relief aid of 100,000. Now, these first two key challenges, one, that you either you have delays that they come when most of the businesses have given up, or two, they, the small coverage that you roll them out and very few people, or the scope is very small that you do not as, uh, help many that deserve or need this kind of support. The second issue that came out was prioritization. Take an example of revenue collection versus livelihood. An example is the, is the fee, or rather the, the, the tax on fuel. Many petrol stations or fuel stations that were surveyed or that were visited during uh, this rapid assessment reported that the tax, the 100, pa, uh, the 100 shilling addition uh, per liter of fuel had far-reaching effects, especially during this time of lockdown when the demand is so low and purchasing power is very low. So they said when you impose this, when they are struggling, it uh, affects especially the small uh, fuel stations who the risk of, clo of closure. The related one is the tax on data. Now we realize that when the lockdown hit, the physical interaction was reduced significantly and many people went digital. So most of the businesses that had switched to digital platforms to enhance or to maintain their customers were actually suffered when the tax was imposed. Now what does this tell us? 
Uh, you realize that when you impose a tax in times like this, depending on what you're taxing, you actually risk uh, eliminating some of the players from the industry. And many businesses, especially those that are relying on digital platforms, are likely to close because of that. Now, the other text to governance systems and delivery mechanism is the exclusion, the exclusion of some of the interventions. I'll give an example of uh, the most recent relief aid, uh, the 100,000 that were sent to uh, different uh, individuals, that vulnerable individuals. Now, in many communities, we went to take an example of Chiguanya, uh, LC1, this is in Obusega, it's a slum area. We had a conversation with the uh, secretary to the local council who told us that many people, vulnerable people in her LC1, actually do not have phones. And many of them were even not registered. They did not have NIN. Yet the requirement was that one had to have a phone and then you have to register your NIN. So she, she explained that many of her people were not registered. What you would call the poorest of the poor were not registered because they did not meet the criteria. So the targeting can actually be exclu uh, uh, can exclude some of the key people that deserve such an intervention. Uh, the other related uh, example is the, uh, the involvement of local councils in identification of beneficiaries. We went to a number of communities that or where we were told that it was the town clerk. Now that is at town council level who was responsible uh, for, for identifying the beneficiaries of these 100,000. And the key question was, how can a town clerk that is up there find a beneficiary at a very micro level, at a cell level. So this posed a, a great challenge that you find many people who deserve this uh, intervention missing out. So that comes back to the targeting that can be exclusive. All these uh, uh, put a question on whether the delivery mechanisms uh, are actually working. Now the last one uh, on, the, on the governance systems and delivery mechanisms are the unintended outcomes of mobility restrictions. Look at the lockdown requirement of the two people per truck. Now, the many traders we talk to say some tra uh, trusted traders, uh, transporters and the truck drivers, which have only two people, meaning that the trader cannot go with them, to go and get them uh, goods. And many of them disappeared or they stole the goods. So there's a lot to that. Like, how do you trust a truck with a turn boy, a truck driver and a turn boy, with your money to go and do the shopping for you? Now, that's at a high level, but even the small uh, vendors in markets, you actually find that the border borders. You send someone, they don't return with the goods that you've sent, sent uh, them to bring. So those put, again, a challenge to the delivery mechanisms. Now, the last point I want to speak about is the coping mechanism or the coping versus resilience. The key question we have is, are the SMEs or MSMEs in Uganda coping or building resilience? Coping is largely a short term, and it, is, I could, it signifies uh, hanging there. Resilience would look at the long-term sustainability from short-term tactics to medium and long-term capabilities. Now, most MSMEs in Uganda are just hanging in there based on the findings from the recent uh, rapid survey that EPRC undertook. Most MSMEs are just hanging in there because of the key coping strategies, which included laying off workers, cost minimization, sleeping in the markets. Again, this was a regulation from the government that you cannot commute from home to work, especially for women, to avoid contacts. Now, this had unintended consequences. Most women that had underlying causes, like asthma, are actually are in bad condition now, especially from the sleeping in the cold. We also found that many markets uh, in the Kampala metropolitan do not have sanitary, uh, sanitary or hygienic uh, public uh, facilities. Uh, we were in one market in, uh, in, uh, in Kireka, it's called the New Farmers Market, where we found that many women were uh, showering in the open, and the only private facility that is available uh, only closes at 6 p.m. And it's also expensive, good, hygienic, but it closes at 6 p.m. So these are the challenges that these women are facing, in addition, of course, to security concerns in other markets that do not have good security, among others. So when we close, and the measures we put in place can have actually far-reaching implications. Now, the other coping mechanism that uh, many vendors and traders adopted is diversification of enterprises. We have many that moved from selling perishables, the very perishables like bananas, like avocado, to the less perishable, 
even if they are still uh, uh, agricultural commodities. So many shifted from bananas to say green matoke because that one has a shelf life of about four to five days. Because again, the biggest challenge we found is uh, commodities are rotting in markets, especially in all these uh, uh, markets or food markets uh, in Kampara Metropolitan. So you have this coping mechanism that is really to take you for a day or two, but is not building resilience. Uh, the other one was borrowing money from friends. And again, we had a question uh, in that rapid assessment where we asked traders how far they can go if this lockdown is, ex uh, lockdown is extended beyond 42 days. And many reported that they will pack their things and go back home. Because they had used up capital, they were borrowing from friends and relatives and even from financial institutions that if you extend it, they cannot hold on, on for more days. Now, this calls for probably policymakers to reconsider this lockdown or put in place measures that can aid recovery of these business businesses. The other key uh, in, uh, coping mechanisms we find sale of household items. Uh, and diversification of enterprises, we have many uh, innovative people that were more, women who are shifting from agribusiness to service industry. I think I want to emphasize two key issues that have emerged from our conversation so far. The first is that there is a substantial difference between businesses that are coping and businesses that are building resilience. Coping is basically like hanging in there. Not necessarily meaningfully, but hanging in there, surviving on the margins with no substantial profitability of business, with no substantial hope of progress. But resilience building is the ability to embark on capabilities that transform the business, maybe from a micro to a medium enterprise in a five-year period. Maybe from one depending on open markets, no official premise, Joakali farms, to one that has proper premises. Maybe from one which has no culture of record keeping to one that now keeps records. From a business that is non-bankable on account of their structural rigidities to one that is bankable. From a business that uses family labor, household labor, to a business that recruits professionals to run the enterprise. So what we need to communicate as a key message from our field research is that many of our enterprises are coping. What we need is to build resilience by making these enterprises more viable companies, more viable businesses for our people. And we hope that happens in our lifetime. So now, the second issue I need to emphasize is that resilience building is not just desirable, it is possible. So what I want to do now is to proceed to outline a real world story a case study that we found in the field of an enterprise that has embarked on transformative resilience building. And this is no other than Victoria Schools. Victoria Schools were established in about 2000. Victoria Schools, the founder of Victoria Schools is Dr. Barbara Ofono. And Dr. Barbara Ofono holds a PhD, very well trained. Already we are already seeing that. The leadership is coming from somebody who is well prepared in terms of training, then there appears to be chances of success. So Victoria Schools faced, faced a crisis just like any, just like any business enterprises within Greater Kampara or even the rest of the country. Victoria Schools said, look, necessity is the mother of innovation. We shall not retreat, we shall not surrender, we shall stay in business and we start, shall stay fighting. So what are some of those things they did which appear to communicate a clear message of the possibility of transformative resilience building? Number one, the leadership of Victoria Schools led by Dr. Barbara Ofono said we must begin by tapping into what we already had. And the starting point was the idea of the pre-existing disaster preparedness space, which was created by a circle. The circle that Victoria Schools had before COVID was now re-examined as a new vehicle for business survival and the resilience of the employees. 
So what the leadership of Victoria School said was, wait a minute, our circle was, had members, but, it, but membership was voluntary. We are now proceeding to make it compulsory. Now, this is already communicating the significance of firm leadership. So the leadership said membership to the circle is going to be compulsory. Number two, the leadership emphasized that while most members, faced with a disaster, wanted to withdraw all their savings and go disappear, make a living, eat the money before they die, drink, marry another wife, get married to another man, probably. But the leadership said, look, you are not going to withdraw 100% of your savings. You are going to withdraw only a portion. If you have a saving of 500,000 shillings, oh, some people had savings of up to 3 million, you are not permitted to withdraw all of the money. Number three, when you withdraw the money, it is not for eating. It is for beginning an enterprise, a market stall, a roadside business, a charcoal business. It is not for eating. It is not taking your savings to eat them and disappear. So what happens? The leadership reported in our field interviews that a significant proportion of people who withdrew their savings took the money within three months, businesses had failed. But we also got a percentage estimated to be about 40 of those who started businesses and were able to succeed. Both categories came back to the circle. But number five, what we see with Victoria schools is the ability of the leadership to promote a culture of adaptability via reskilling the teachers. The teachers were taken through training in PowerPoint presentation. They were taken through training in digital teaching and learning. They were taken through Google Class. And they, so they were, new spaces were being opened for the, for the teachers. Now, the interesting thing is that it was not easy because these adjustment and adaptability mechanisms were embark embarked upon during the lockdown. So what the leadership of Victoria Schools did in the light of the restrictions on the number of people you could move in a car, they would move employees in twos. So put two in a car, get a driver, move them to Mukono in a central training venue, subject them to the training and the readjustment. And then, number six, the Victoria Schools embarked on reaching out to the learners and actually retraining them. The key message was twofold. Number one, the learners were told the brick and mortar school might actually not survive the COVID induced disaster. The brick and mortar school has to be rethought. Your school is now going to be a virtual learning space. The second message to the learners was adaptability is the key to evading extinction. So children, you have to adapt. You may not see your teachers physically. You may not see your head teacher physically. You're going to see them virtually. I want to end by emphasizing that in all of these adaptability measures embarked upon by Victoria Schools, what we see is the ability of the leadership to be firm, to be creative, to think outside the box, and to communicate a message of hope, even in the context of disaster. So what we are seeing is now the school learning outcomes, the evidence is still anecdotal, but we seem to be seeing that the results from the primary living examinations are pointing to better outcomes. As I said, for me as a teacher and as a researcher, I think the results are still anecdotal. We cannot make conclusions. But it appears that when the mother and the dad at home, in some cases the dad, but primarily the mother, becomes the teacher, the learning outcomes appear to be improving. And the other interesting thing is that our children are very, very adaptable to digital spaces. They are learning and learning very fast. They are adaptable, they, they are trainable. The third issue is that actually even for the teachers who were not doing proper preparation, now they are forced to prepare. You will need to prepare content, teaching content. You, a PowerPoint, you, you're not going to speak off the cuff. You're not going to use the old lecture notes that you had. So we are seeing, yes, COVID-19 has been a disaster. But the message we wish to communicate as Makerere University, but also as Economic Policy Research Center, is that there is hope. 
Necessity is the mother of innovation. Thank you very much. That a research presentation will be done like that. How many times have you seen that? Now that is innovation that is unwittingly coming out of COVID. As uh, the panelists move up uh, to take their seats, uh, there are a couple of slides that uh, you didn't see there, but I can just go through in one minute. Uh, in terms of the innovations that uh, sprang out of COVID, uh, the country switched from alcohol to sanitizer manufacture. You saw that. And you saw the uh, making of washing stands, no longer opening taps. Online digital platforms sprang up or were strengthened. Today I've been having an interview with the boss of Jumia and he says there's some good things, there's some challenges also. And of course there was a tendency towards uh, local tourism. It struggled as you can see now, local tourists can't move. But yes, there was suddenly a jack into, did you think about local tourists? And the question, therefore, and also the development of local uh, medicines, vaccines like COVIDX. COVIDX is not a vaccine, but medicines like that, innovation. And it shows it's possible. So the question then, arising from that, how can government leverage on local innovation to aid recovery and resilience of MSMEs? In other words, is government learning, even while it's trying to help keep its citizens um, alive? And of course, lastly, Policy implications. Government should build the cap capabilities of MSMEs before taxing them. That is uh, uh, thinking 10 steps before you make a decision for government. Closure of MSMEs may be inevitable, but is costly. That's the problem. Unemployment and everything else. Closure is disruptive and uh, should be the last option, and that, that means the lockdown. Government should consider boosting citizens' immunity via nutrition, ETC, strengthen the health systems, and pay health workers well. We have had some meetings in that direction. Hopefully it sticks. Private schools serve as a public cause and must be beneficiaries of stimulus package. This time around, they can't be left on their own. And lastly, trust. It has been mentioned there, trust in governance. If government promises, they should deliver. And this time around, the research showed that people, are, uh, people don't trust because some things were said and were not done. Perhaps government did not explain. That includes the 20 billion to the teacher's circle and many other areas. So that was, those are the slides you did not see, though one of two issues was touched in that presentation. Now I want to move on to our panel, panelists. If you see our panelists, they are all men. That is not that there is insensitivity. There was a lady there. Unfortunately, she was not able to join us because she had some challenges. But let me introduce uh, my panelists. Um, from the extreme, depending on the TV, maybe right, uh, is Mr. Daniel Bironji, who is the executive director for Uganda Manufacturers Association. Welcome in a blue shirt. Next to him in a suit, gray like me, is Mr. Joseph Enyimu, who is, uh, let me just get these titles correct, it's very important. Mr. Enyimu is the Commissioner, Economic Development, Policy and Research Department at the Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development. So he loves research best, and that's what we are here discussing. Next to him in a black suit is Mr. John Walugembe, very well known these days, John. He's the director for the Federation of Small and Medium Enterprises, your people, we are being discussed. And finally, Mr. Francis Abibi, chief economist, Uganda Development Bank, one of the key, area, key institutions in this equation. Welcome, uh, gentlemen. We'll go straight to the questions. Um, let me start with uh, Mr. Birunji. Give us a picture. In terms of resilience and impact, how have the manufacturers are fared? And you can, three minutes if you like. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for, for, for that introduction. Now, first, 
I don't know if I can be heard. Yeah, perfect. So first off, I think we're, it's in order for us to say thank you to PPRC for the research. It pretty much mirrors a lot of what we're seeing as manufacturers and as the Manufacturers Association. I'll tell you that uh, how manufacturers are coping, first of all, to that question, is that we are seeing a significant decline in market. And uh, anywhere from 20% to 60%, depending on the sector that these manufacturers are engaged in, which is significant. Like the research has indicated, many are hanging in there, barely hanging in there. I think the term would be barely coping, not even coping. And when we talk to them, they say, one, is that a lot of their products, of course, are not sold by them, but are sold through the shops and the dukas all over the communities. Now, if the people who are manning these, uh, the, these facilities are unable to go into, into, into work, it means that, of course, their products stay in there. The other element that is tangential to that is that you then have a situation where, for example, given that manufacturers usually give 45 to 90 day credit, there is a lot of stock that's out there that has not been paid for. The opportunities for that stock to be paid for is slowly vanishing as the lockdown continues. And so that's a key worry as far as uh, recovery is concerned once opening up happens. The other element is that we find that a lot of our manufacturing, a lot of our economy is tied to the school system. Schools having been closed for quite a while means that the maize miller who would have supplied maize, uh, sorry, uh, kaunga to a school is unable to do so at the moment. As such, that's tied up. The poultry person who would have supplied eggs is also unable to do so. So the ripple effects from the closure go beyond even the sectors that we would have thought of ordinarily. And so we are seeing a bit of, uh, of reduction in ability to recover. Now, relatedly, on the part of resilience, we are seeing a lot of movement towards automation. Because having come through the first lockdown and found that, for example, the big numbers of stuff that they had could not be retained either because of the restrictions requiring them to embed their staff at the workplace or because of the requirements to transport these staff. Several of our members and manufacturers are now moving to invest in automation. That then presents two challenges. One is the challenge that, of course, automation comes at a high cost, which then goes into credit. And that's where my colleague from UDB will step in to then speak about the credit aspects. But the other bit, is that we are then losing jobs that will not be recovered. Because once I automate and do not need a sorter to sort my maize, do not need an egg picker in a human form to pick my eggs, it means when we get back to production, these jobs are gone, and we're not going to get them back again. Of course, on the positive side is that, of course, that then means that there's a bit of resilience coming on board, in as far as these organizations are concerned, but we have to be mindful that at the end of the day, I think the biggest challenge we have as a nation is jobs. We need as many jobs as possible. How do we, see, how do we have these discussions uh, at the same time? Lastly, of course, on credit. And uh, I, commend, I commend UDB. I think it has gone out and gotten a lot of financing. Unfortunately, uh, I think our biggest challenge is that, and, and our biggest pitch is that funding that comes external from Uganda comes with attached conditions. Because if I'm getting uh, funding from the Islamic Bank, for example, it will be trade-related to say, I need you to come and pick products from Kuwait and bring them to Uganda. The funding we require is the funding that can unlock manufacturing that can lock investment in, for example, MUKO, to ensure that iron ore is, is, is smelted here and as such, we are able to, to, to benefit from reducing our importation of iron billets. And that funding seems to be limited at the moment. Uh, there was a bit of money provided for, for, for COVID relief, but the number, the, the stretch of the money, the number of people it was able to help is quite low. Uh, more would have been needed. So I'll stop there for now.
Daniel, I'll come back to you. We are still discussing. We just want to have a first round before we, uh, we lose the TV audience. Um, John, and then I'll come to Abib, and then finally, <laughs> Mr. Newman, <is> deliberately, <laughs> you last. <laughs> John, I know you have several hammered down the point. We are suffering. Is there some resilience among the SMEs, your members? Okay, in Uganda, there's a saying that when you see someone crying, they make you have you cry even louder. So you want to thank EPRC for joining us in expressing some of the concerns that our members have uh, regarding the difficulties they've been encountering at the moment. Secondly, I picked two points that I'll address later. First, uh, Dr. Sonia talked about associations being inactive in raising working capital. I'll address that later. Then the second point was about coping and resilience. The difference between coping and resilience. I would say, based on the findings, that SMEs are not resilient at the moment. They are simply coping in the midst of a difficult situation. First of all, many of them are suffering in the area of liquidity. Liquidity is still a problem. They allocated money to UDB. Well, in the budget it said to COVID relief, but at the end of the day we found that it was for the real, what they call the real economy and, and so on. So, some money to UDB, some money to microfinance support center, some money to UDC and so on. We are not feeling the impact. That is the point. It's not that we don't like what has been done, but the impact is not being felt. Secondly, and as my colleague mentioned, we have a serious collapse in demand. Close to 70% of our members are not working. It's only a few businesses in manufacturing, in uh, the medical space, and others that are, the rest are home. They are seated. Mm. They are now just surviving and looking for food and so on. Then we are also having a severe drop in capacity, capacity utilization. You know, even for those that are operating in the manufacturing space, mm. you find that most of them are operating below 50% mm. capacity. So these issues still exist. These SMEs are simply coping, and the coping measures have been highlighted. And I completely agree that uh, there is need to support that there is need to support the transition of our MSME sector away from coping uh, towards resilience. Resilience is a good word, but it takes a lot of effort. See, they talked about creativity, preparedness. As an association, we focus on four things. We focus on profits because we have been supporting some SMEs in the refugee spaces since this pandemic start, struck. Rather. We focus on profits, we focus on people, we focus on processes, we focus on partnerships. Those are very important. Partnerships, we focus on the policy environment. Why do you have 12% tax on data, yet you, one of your program is your digitalization and you, know you are encouraging people to go online? That, I think, should be eliminated. People, how can we support the creation of new jobs in this new era? Profits, how do we ensure that our businesses don't collapse so that they keep bringing in revenue? Because ultimately, the URA will benefit. If businesses are making money, URA and government will benefit. Lastly, partnerships. How do we ensure that we build networks between different actors in a, in a way that is supportive to the MSME sector? So to answer your question, we are not yet resilient. We are simply coping. Okay. I seem to hear from David and you, John, that we are hanging in there, as the report said. So we need to move because there will be other crises. Let's move, let me move to Mr. Bibi, the economist. Um, UDB, and it was it's going all over, 100 million shillings minimum. That's the reputation it's carrying around. Now we're discussing MSME. I need... 5 million, 10 million. Can you be playing that space? Uh, thank you, moderator. And uh, thank you, EPRC, for the research and for inviting us to give our views on the research. Now, I think to answer your question, uh, I think as a bank, uh, that was what we were doing uh, in terms of threshold. Uh, we were at that level. But I think recently, with this COVID, uh, we did a research on MSMEs. And, and what we have done, 
is that we have looked at the sector very carefully. Uh, and what we have just done, which is about to be the paper, which, the framework which is supposed to be launched any time from now, and I think most of you will be invited, we designed a specific framework which will guide our intervention in areas of SMEs. Uh, of course, the policy and the, and the procedure to be followed in that. And, and in, in that, we have really taken care of some of the, the bottlenecks which were preventing uh, SMEs from accessing finance and other, and other issues that are related for, to, their, to their capacity building. So we have come up with the issues of, uh, you know, we have been asking for business plans, but we realize that SMEs, that is not necessary. We can design a small form which they can fill and quicken the process. We have looked at collaterals. We realize that if you look at most of the business we call SMEs, which forms a bigger proportion and contributes very highly in terms of our GDP, over 70%, they don't have collateral. So how do we deal with this collateral problem? We have looked at the issue of, can we look at the, where they are located? If they don't own that land, how can we come in to help them to own that land? If there, are, if there are land agreements which can be used as security, why can't we do that? So we have looked at quite a number of things to turn out of the facility. They, are, they, 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 they may not need only credit. In crisis time like this, people talk of credit, credit. But if you intervene and give somebody credit, somebody who is suffering, is that enough? Because he has no cash flow. The revenue is, uh, is below capacity, as Mr. Walogemba said. Can, if you give him credit, can he prepay it? It may not be possible. So you need to blend. You may need an element of grant to support the working capital requirement in terms of expenses and other day-to-day -day expenses. And you also need some credit maybe for expansion purpose for the future. So you need to look at quite a number of things. And we have built this in the new policy which we have, we have designed. And, and it, is, it has almost, the process of approval has been completed. And any time we are going to launch, and I think that would be a good drive towards building the resilience of the SMEs in the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Abib. Um, I see that resilience is something to aspire towards. It doesn't exist. This economy has never been hit by a crisis by which we realize that we have to be resilient. And yet now, the report and all the submissions seem to say that we need to build resilience to be able to survive shocks because this is by no means the last one. Let me turn to you, Joseph, uh, from Minister of Finance. Um, we cannot now uh, go back to the issue of um, the impact of the lockdown and COVID on the economy. But I'll come to you. Can the lockdown, should the lockdown be extended or should it be curtailed? You sit somewhere in the middle of policy and the politicians. Can we dare extend the, the lockdown? What's your take? Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I would like to recognize that uh, I think the lockdown has served Uganda very well. I am very pleased that uh, the rate of spread of you know, uh, the Corona-19 um, virus has been uh, curtailed and that uh, even the deaths associated with the pandemic uh, have come down. And I think we need to recognize that, that the value of life um, cannot be under, you know, played in this matter. So in terms of priorities, saving lives, uh, I think we won't have a debate about that. It's important that lives have been preserved. The cost might have been high, but um, uh, it is worth uh, meeting that cost. Now, on your question about whether we should sustain this or uh, we should uh, you know, try another course. I think let's recognize that just as we are gathered here to listen to evidence uh, that EPRC has presented, 
that is a, a decision that requires evidence from different um, fields of our society. It will depend on um, what our scientists tell us. It will depend on what is unfolding in the space of uh, livelihoods and uh, just how our capabilities have adjusted. I think that's important that not only is the um, situation of the virus adjusting, but the systems of both government and society are also adjusting. Families are adjusting, communities are adjusting, the health systems are adjusting, and as we have heard, even businesses are adjusting. So having an understanding of that adjustment process will inform uh, the magnitude by which we should change the status quo. I think I leave it at that for now. Thank you. Joseph, you have answered this very cleverly. You have not said we go, we don't go. But we look at, uh, if to, to, as a takeaway, we take, we take all the variables and make a decision. Of course, certainly. I can't uh, insist too much on you, Joseph, because the final decision maker is uh, the number one citizen of the, citizen of the country, who is um, His Excellency, <laughs> President Joram Seveni. And that speech is going to be, um, we're going to listen to it tomorrow, even while we wonder what's going to happen tomorrow morning before the, as the lockdown ends today, officially for two days. But that's, we'll watch to see what happens there. We are going to let our audience on TV, the live audience, go. Um, but we're continuing on Zoom, and because it is virtual, most of you are on Zoom. Uh, please stay with us. We are going to take your questions. There will be a plenary uh, to discuss with uh, the panelists. However, we are going to dis continue our discussion with the panelists on uh, trying to break down and understand the implications of these uh, re research findings plus uh, solutions, maybe, and analysis. Uh, so for those who have been live, uh, joining us live on TV, we will let you go. We are here at uh, Golf Course Hotel. We, it's a blend between TV live, screen, and Zoom. That is a new uh, way that is emerging out of uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and lockdown. So for those on live TV, we say goodbye, but those on Zoom, we stay. And I want to move back to Daniel. <laughs>